a quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency, Financial Management, and Intergovernmental Relations will come to order. Every year on April 15th, the Internal Revenue Service holds American taxpayers accountable for the accurate reporting of their tax liabilities. The Internal Revenue Service must be held equally accountable. That's the purpose of our hearing today. Specifically, we're here to examine the progress the Internal Revenue Service is making to resolve its many management and performance challenges. Each year, our subcommittee holds an annual oversight hearing focusing exclusively on Internal Revenue Service. As in previous years, the distinguished Commissioner of Internal Revenue, Charles Vasati, is our lead witness today. This is particularly notable occasion since it will be Commissioner Rosati's last regular appearance before this subcommittee. Mr. Rosati's five-year statutory term as Commissioner expires in November of this year. He's done an outstanding job in an extremely challenging position. The Internal Revenue Service is charged with enforcing the nation's tax laws and collecting nearly 95 percent of the federal government's annual revenue. The agency collects about $2 trillion a year in tax payments, yet a series of management problems have plagued the agency and severely impeded its performance. These were long-standing problems that confronted Commissioner Rosati when he was sworn in. He knew at that time that to make the changes which would require change would be several years. He has kept the faith and stuck it out and we have the highest respect for the commissioner. And we hope in the last few months uh, of his term uh, that uh, he will uh, do everything he can to make sure that the Internal Revenue Service is doing the best it can. And I was delighted that uh, President Bush and Secretary O'Neill had uh, furthered him. And when I talked to uh, uh, Secretary O'Neill, uh, that uh, the commissioner should be uh, maintained. Uh, the secretary said, I sure hope to, and I beat you to it. <laughs> so you've got a lot of friends, despite the problems that we have all over the government. The agency's inability to make effective use of information technology is another chronic problem. The Internal Revenue Service appears to be recovering from past failures and has developed a sound modernization blueprint. It now faces the major challenge of implementing that blueprint. Computer security is another major challenge for the Internal Revenue Service, as it is for most federal agencies. Indeed, the agency's inspector general has identified security, including information security, as the most serious of all risks facing the Internal Revenue Service. The management problems at the Internal Revenue Service have taken a severe toll on its performance. Tax enforcement and collection activities have declined dramatically over the last decade. I'm particularly concerned about the agency's abysmal performance in collecting delinquent debt. The General Accounting Office reports that the Internal Revenue Service had discontinued collection action on nearly $12 billion in tax delinquencies as of March 2001. The agency primarily blames this on the lack of resources. At the same time, however, the IRS consistently resists the idea of using private contractors to assist in its collection efforts, and I find that inexclusible. Finally, the Internal Revenue Service needs to be substantially improved for its customer service. It's done a fine job in many ways. It must do a better job of picking up the telephone when the taxpayers call and providing accurate answers. Although I've laid out a litany of problems, I'm confident that Commissioner Rosati has charted a course that will eventually overcome the agency's core problems and fundamentally improve its performance. Under Mr. Rosati's capable leadership, there are already signs of progress. However, many deeply rooted problems remain. There is much more work to be done. And I will now uh, swear in today's uh, witnesses and look forward uh, to your testimony. 
you'll raise the right hand, to Commissioner, and do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give uh, before this subcommittee and will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And I note one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You got a good uh, team today, and uh, the clerk will note that they affirm the oath. So, Commissioner. We're delighted to have you. Your full statement, as you know, goes into the record at this point, and we'd like you to uh, do your summary of it on the high points, and uh, then we'll go to the other members that are going to be sitting with you. So now proceed in any way you'd like. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I especially appreciate your comments about me. Uh, I, uh, again, appreciate your holding this hearing and the opportunity to testify about what we've accomplished and what we still have to accomplish. I will note on the subject of collection support, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I am recused from that. And I have Mr. Bennett here with me to testify if questions come up on that subject. Um, I particularly, Mr. Chairman, want to uh, express my gratitude for the support you've given to our modernization program over the years. I uh, can remember uh, it was about three years ago that I was testifying to the subcommittee about the challenges related to the year 2000 conversion, which was a subject of great concern at that time. Uh, fortunately, uh, that program was a complete success, and it also provided some long-term benefits in improving the standardization and management of our systems process. And since then, we have also uh, made uh, some of the other improvements that you have pushed for, and of course, we're working on others. I would like to note on one chart, which uh, we're going to put up and which you have a copy of in front of you, that the uh, improvements that we have made in the agency have been recognized by the American public. The Roper Start Survey, a public survey, found that our rating has increased uh, in each of the last three years after reaching an all-time low in 1998. And I think it's called public rating of the IRS, Mr. Chairman. Um, there are two lines on it. One is Roper Starch. The other is the University of Michigan Customer Satisfaction Survey, uh, which also showed a considerable improvement in customer satisfaction by our individual taxpayers. This was the largest favorable gain of the 30 federal agencies that were surveyed. Uh, the turnaround in the public's rating of the IRS, I think, is important for the health of the tax system. Uh, it's not acceptable for the government agency that affects more Americans than any other agency to also be rated the lowest. Uh, changing that was a mandate incorporated in the Restructuring Act, and we are beginning, and I do stress beginning, to deliver on the mandate of changing that. Uh, while the trend is good, as you've noted, a lot more needs to be done. Let me briefly address our filing season, which, of course, uh, for most taxpayers is ending today. This is the period in which most individual taxpayers interact with the IRS and form their opinion of the IRS. And I'm putting up a second chart, which you also have in front of you, which shows some trends in some important indicators of service during the past two years. Uh, there's uh, one set of numbers uh, which you'll notice uh, are increasing literally off the chart, uh, in a high way off the chart. Um, and those are the ones that relate to the use of the Internet, our IRS website, irs.gov. In January, we introduced a whole new design, which was designed to make this site more accessible. And its usage continues to grow. And its practical significance for taxpayers is that they're getting information and forms uh, when they need them without having to make last-minute trips to the post office and perhaps uh, guess at things that they really should be able to look up very easily. Another important line on this chart, which is loaded electronically filed returns, is also up very substantially. Uh, we set an aggressive goal for this year of receiving 46 million 1040 returns electronically which would be a 15 percent increase over last year. And I'm pleased to say, looking at the numbers this morning, that we are on track to even exceed our goal of 46 million. I should also note that uh, with the help of a provision reported by the Ways and Means Committee uh, a few weeks ago, which is to extend the uh, filing date uh, for those who file and pay electronically from April 15th to April 30th, uh, that proposal, if enacted by the full Congress, will help us to continue or even accelerate this trend. Uh, there are a number of lines on this chart that relate to the quality of phone service. And I'm also pleased to report that we're making progress uh, in the face, by the way, of increased customer demand, uh, primarily because of the increased calls concerning the rate reduction credit 
The total volume of incoming calls on our toll-free lines for the fiscal year through the first half, March 30th, were up 13 percent, totaling 51 million calls. Uh, I'm, there's another chart which is about to come up which just shows the service by month. And I think the important point is there was a surge of calls in February uh, which temporarily drove down the service. We were able to respond, however, and as you can see, it rapidly improved so that since the beginning of March, it's been above uh, our goal of 71 percent. And finally, with respect to quality and accuracy, our responses have also improved substantially. The correct response rate for tax law and account calls were up to 83 and 89 percent this year, up from 75 and 88 percent. So those are indicators, uh, as noted on the trend chart, that are up in the right direction. They're still not, in all cases, uh, up to the level that they need to be, but they're clearly going in the right direction. Now let me turn to the matter of efficiency, which is one of the subjects of this committee's jurisdiction. Uh, our key here is to leverage our limited resources as much as we can through better management and fundamental re-engineering of our business processes. And we've been able to do that, and again I'm uh, putting up another chart uh, that shows how we're reallocating our, our resources uh, to where they are going to be needed the most. This is primarily in improving customer service and in our key enforcement and compliance activities. And as you can see in this chart, Mr. Chairman, for the fiscal year that is now before the Congress, 03, we're proposing to achieve $259 million worth of increased program delivery, uh, but with a net in requested increase of only 50, 63 million. So in other words, 76 percent of the improvements that we are uh, hoping to achieve will be achieved by internal efficiency and only the rest will be achieved by increased resources. Uh, this is directly responsive, we think, to the mandate to improve efficiency. Now let me turn briefly to the modernization program, which I know is very important to you, Mr. Chairman. There is a $58 million increase noted, uh, requested rather, for our, our modernization pro projects. And I think one of the things that is important now is that business systems modernization is graduating from the planning stage to uh, the design and implementation of business results. And again, another chart here, uh, a very oversimplified one, I should note, but it gets the j basic idea. The green blocks uh, in FY 2001 and 2002 represent some critical building blocks that will be put in place. In 2001, last year, we established a new communications infrastructure for taxpayer telephone calls, which is one of the reasons that we are providing better service this year. Now, in 2002, this coming year, uh, we plan to move the records of some of our taxpayers out of the 1960s tape-based system to a modern, reliable database. And finally, we plan to establish an IRS-wide security infrastructure to uh, manage external and internal secure access to our systems, something that is directly responsive to the point you noted in your opening about security. I should note that, as we sometimes do, we have recently experienced a delay in one part of this program, but nevertheless, we have adjusted to that. We still expect to achieve the important goals that are noted uh, in the chart. We've also gained valuable lessons as we have moved forward with these projects, and we are giving equal attention to improve the quality of the way we, and the maturity of the way we manage the program, as well as in delivering specific projects. One of the most important things that we have accomplished, as has been noted by GAO, is that we have completed uh, the second release of our enterprise architecture. That is what is behind this entire circle. This is just a little picture of it. I can provide you a CD if you would like to browse it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it shows all 3,000 pages or so of what the future of the IRS is going to be. Um, I, I have to say I am very proud of this particular product. I worked in this industry. Uh, before taking the IRS job for 28 years. And it's quite easy to just produce a few charts and show that you have an enterprise architecture. I think that the one that we have worked on for two years is really the most rigorous that I am aware of. And I believe it will provide, as you again noted in your opening, a blueprint for the future of the IRS in modernizing its business practices as well as its technology. Uh, we are also, as I noted, uh, working on improving the maturity of our management processes. We, I think, are in good shape on using a rigorous enterprise life cycle methodology. Uh, we are uh, in less good shape on some other management processes, which we are working on diligently to improve, and especially in addressing the recommendations of GAO and uh, the IG. 
And if, now let me mention uh, something about our financial statements, another topic of this committee. I'm pleased to say that uh, GAO issued an unqualified or clean opinion on IRS financial statements for fiscal year 2001 for the second year in a row on both our revenue and administrative accounts. And I would say that certainly this success can in part be attributed to the hard work and dedication of both the IRS staff and the GAO staff. But it can also be traced to, to improvements that we have made, notwithstanding some of our systems limitations, in our internal controls and also our management focus. For example, in February of 2002, a couple of months ago, we were able for the first time to achieve a three-day monthly close on our books, something that Secretary O'Neill is very keen on. And this was certainly a big milestone in the IRS. Some internally even thought we could not do this, but we did. Uh, so we know that we are uh, making progress, but we still have considerable requirements to improve financial management in part based on our improved technology. And we are working on the dual track, which we've noted in every year in this hearing, making those pro uh, processes, that improvements that we can, and also modernizing our systems, which is a longer term effort. And finally, Mr. Chairman, let me briefly comment on the National Taxpayer Advocates report on the problems that taxpayers face in trying to comply with the complexity of the tax code. Internally, we are working, as I've noted, to improve service to taxpayers. However, even our best efforts in that regard will be uh, limited to a significant degree unless we can somehow deal with the staggering complexity that everyone n notes is woven into the tax code. And I would say especially in those areas of the tax code that most average taxpayers must cope with, such as the definition of a child and a marriage. I think most taxpayers legitimately wonder why is it so hard to define what a child is? Um, I've been wondering about that myself ever since I've been commissioner. And uh, the Taxpayer Advocates Report lays out the amazing uh, uh, items that are in the code about the definition of a child and other related family issues. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I, I think we can be proud of the progress that we have achieved over the past year, over the past few years, and I think the indicators are in the right direction. But I would be the last one in the room to declare victory at this point. Um, I know that we have so much more to do, and I think that if we stay focused on the path that we're on that was laid out in the Restructuring Act and is defined in more detail in our modernization plan, and of course make adjustments as we learn more, we, we do learn every year, but if we don't lose sight of our goals, I really do think that we can succeed. Um, and uh, your support has been important in the progress we've made, and we thank you for that. Uh, that concludes my testimony. I thank you, and uh, we will now have the uh, presentation of Larry R. Levitan. Uh, the Honorable Mr. Levitan is the chairman of the Internal Revenue Service Oversight Board. And why don't we have the others come now to the uh, chairs. Michael Brostek, the Director, Tax thank Administration you. Issues, U.S. General Accounting Office, Pamela Gardner, Deputy Inspector General for Audit, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, and finally, Nina E. Olson, National Taxpayer Advocate, Internal Revenue Service. So we'll start in with Mr. Levitan, and we'd like your uh, statement to be summarized. All of these statements are automatically in the hearing record and uh, then we can have a better basis for questioning and the commissioner has uh, done this before so uh, let's uh, talk with uh, the chairman of the oversight board thank you mr chairman mr chairman and members of the subcommittee thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify let me preface my remarks by providing a brief explanation of the role of the IRS Oversight Board. The board was created as part of the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998. That legislation assigns the Oversight Board the responsibility for overseeing the IRS and its administration and management and its supervision of the execution and application of the Internal Revenue Code. These duties closely resemble those of a corporate board of directors. In its 2001 annual report, the Oversight Board reported that the IRS is still not effectively and efficiently serving the needs of the American taxpayers, although it has made significant progress since 1997. 
Customer service, although improved as we've just seen, has not risen to desired levels and enforcement activity has fallen for many years. These problems are compounded by outmoded computer systems that handicap IRS workers and prevent the delivery of effective service. It is not surprising that this environment has resulted in dissatisfied taxpayers, inadequate job satisfaction among IRS employees, and difficulty in achieving improved performance. On the positive side, the IRS is making progress and has put in place several key elements that establish a foundation for further progress. Under Commissioner Rosati's leadership, the IRS has made major strides in the last few years. A well-formulated, high-quality strategic planning process has been put in place. Balanced measures are also being implemented. A major reorganization focused on customers was implemented. The senior management team strengthened, and a business systems modernization program that will eventually provide modern business processes and tools for em employees and taxpayers is underway. Neither the IRS nor the Oversight Board is satisfied with the state of the IRS's performance. Performance measures for the key areas of customer service and enforcement are troubling to the Oversight Board. Although the IRS is beginning to show signs of improvement, in customer service. The Oversight Board is very concerned that the, of, that the broad decline in enforcement activity increases our reliance on voluntary compliance and fears that the public's attitude towards voluntary compliance is beginning to erode. Because of this concern, the Oversight Board initiated a survey to obtain data on taxpayers' attitudes regarding their obligations to report and pay their fair share of taxes. The most troubling result was in response to a question that asked, how much, if any, do you think is an acceptable amount to cheat on your income taxes? In 1999, 87% of the respondents replied, not at all. In 2001, just two years later, the percentage of respondents who selected that answer fell to 76%. In short, one-fourth of U.S. citizens believe it is okay to cheat on their taxes. My written testimony provides several examples of troublesome areas of noncompliance, including underreporting of pass-through income, use of offshore credit cards, and the earned income tax credit. These examples highlight a good news, bad news situation. On one hand, the IRS is becoming more knowledgeable about noncompliance. However, declining compliance resources make it difficult to assign additional resources in any meaningful way to investigate these situations and enforce the tax law with noncompliant taxpayers. To better understand compliance issues, the Oversight Board believes there is an urgent need for the IRS to increase its research on taxpayer compliance so it can identify and correct broad areas of noncompliance. The National Research Program is designed to do just that while avoiding the intrusive nature of prior research programs. The Oversight Board strongly supports this program. The most important task the Oversight Board must perform this year is to identify candidates to replace Commissioner Rosati. During his five-year tenure, Commissioner Rosati provided the IRS with the leadership it needed as it went through the most dramatic change in its history. He should be commended for what he has done to transform the IRS into a performance-based organization. I believe he would be the first to say, and did say a few minutes ago, we have much further to go. 
RRA 98 requires the Oversight Board to recommend candidates to the President for the position of IRS Commissioner. The Oversight Board has exercised this responsibility by partnering with the Treasury Department to develop a position and candidate specification describing the qualifications needed and hiring a search firm to identify qualified candidates. Qualified candidates must be CEO caliber executives with relevant operational experience, preferably gained within an intensive information processing and customer service environment. Candidates must understand the leadership challenges of managing a 100,000 person organization. Qualified candidates must also possess credibility and stature with a reputation for being a strong leader and having been an effective change agent. The Oversight Board believes that Charles Rosati has been all of this and more. We believe the country owes him a debt of gratitude for the public service he has given us in the last five years. I appreciate this opportunity to meet with you this morning and would be pleased to respond to any questions that you have. Thank you. That's very useful. The ideas you've put there for the next commissioner. We now go with uh, Michael Brostick, the Director of Tax Administration Issues for the United States General Accounting Office, which is headed by the Controller General of the United States. And uh, we always count on them to analyze what's going on in these hearings. And uh, we always get good uh, recommendations. So Mr. Brostick. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the management challenges that continue to face the IRS. At your request, our statement will cover four areas, financial management, performance management, computer security, and business systems modernization. In each of these areas, IRS is working to improve its operations and has made important progress in the past year. Each area, however, continues to have shortfalls in management controls or capacity that need to be addressed to better ensure the success of IRS's ongoing operations and its long-term reorganization and modernization. By way of perspective, IRS has been in the midst of a major organizational transformation throughout Commissioner Rosati's tenure. Organizational transformations of the scale underway in IRS are long-term endeavors. The Commissioner has often said that the transformation could take a decade, and we agree. Transformations are fraught with risk, and mistakes are virtually inevitable. To succeed, organizations and leaders must learn from their mistakes. Over recent years, we have observed a consistent, constructive reaction from IRS to our recommendations and what appears to us to be a good faith effort to implement the management reform agenda set out by Congress. Turning now to financial management, for the second consecutive year, IRS's financial statement received an unqualified opinion meaning that they were fairly represent or presented. However, this last year, uh, as in the past, was a once in a year, once a year, fair representation of IRS's finances, and it was achieved through substantial, costly, and time-consuming processes that compensated for serious systems and control deficiencies. Consequently, IRS did not have the timely, useful, and reliable information to assist in managing the day-to-day -day operations of the agency, which was the intent of the reform legislation. In addition to concerns about computer security, our audit of IRS's fiscal year 2001 financial statements continued to identify several material internal control weaknesses and other reportable issues related to financial reporting, management of unpaid tax assessments, tax revenue and refunds, taxpayer receipts and data, and accountability over administrative accounts and budgetary resources. Thus, while progress has been made, further efforts are needed to ensure that IRS has accurate, timely information to support decision making. Concerning IRS's overall performance management, IRS has continued to make progress in revamping its performance management system. For example, IRS now uses its strategic planning and budgeting process to reconcile competing priorities and initiatives with available resources. However, however, IRS needs to develop better performance measures and perform more and better evaluations of its business practices to determine what factors affect 
program performance and to identify ways to improve service. Further, consistent with the Government Performance and Results Act, IRS's fiscal year 2003 budget justification links resources requested for telephone services to expected performance. This noteworthy step needs to be extended, for instance, by including in the budget justification the level of resources to be devoted to priority compliance problems identified by IRS and the results IRS expects to achieve with those resources. In the computer security area, IRS has established many policies and procedures and controls to protect the security of its computing resources. And over the past year, IRS has substantially improved the safeguards that control access to its electronic filing systems. During fiscal year 2002, however, we continue to find serious weaknesses with general controls designed to protect IRS's computing resources from unauthorized use, modification, loss, and disclosure. Ineffective implementation of policies, procedures, and controls could undermine the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data provided by IRS. In addition, weaknesses in other information system controls, including physical security, segregation of duties, and service continuity, further increase risk to IRS's computing environment. Finally, I would like to briefly discuss management of IRS's business systems modernization. IRS's ongoing program to leverage information technology to revamp how the service does its business. IRS has made important progress in establishing systems, delivering system applications, and establishing the modernization management controls and capabilities needed to effectively acquire and deploy modernized systems. Although this progress has not yet produced major benefits to the taxpayers, it has been critical in laying the sound foundation from which major benefits can be realized. Despite the progress, IRS is not as far along as it committed to be, and it must implement further management controls and capabilities. Great progress has, greater progress has not been made because IRS's first priority has been getting new systems up and running. Proceeding with new systems before completely building management capacity increases the risk of not delivering promised systems on time and within budget. As IRS moves forward, this risk escalates because system interdependencies and complexity increase dramatically during the later phases of projects. IRS acknowledges these risks and is committed to making correction of management control weaknesses a priority. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. We'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. That's very helpful, and uh, we'll use it in the question period. Uh, Pamela Gardner is the Deputy Inspector General for Audit, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. Good morning. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today. I have submitted to the subcommittee TIGDA's analysis of management challenges facing the IRS. <clears throat> I'd like to focus today on four of those areas. Security of IRS employees, facilities, and information systems, systems modernization, customer service performance, and the decline in enforcement. While the IRS has long recognized the risk that violence against its infrastructure and employees poses, the events of September 11th expanded the security paradigm considerably. For instance, in the past, IRS disaster recovery plans generally addressed the risk of only one site shutting down. The Al-Qaeda terrorist attacks and the subsequent anthrax and bomb threats made it realistically possible that sophisticated forces could incapacitate multiple IRS locations. The IRS is now developing plans to address multiple acts of terrorism and maintain continuity of operations. Completing these actions is important because the IRS is the nation's primary revenue collector, and any disruption of these activities would have a detrimental effect on all government operations. In addition, the increased networking of IRS computers and increased use of the Internet, combined with the growing number of destructive computer viruses, makes the IRS more vulnerable to the risk of data loss or theft. Apart from the external risk, there is an overall lack of awareness of security within IRS among its employees and functional managers have generally not accepted responsibility for security. For example, posing as help desk employees, we contacted 100 IRS employees and asked for their assistance in resolving a fictitious network problem. We asked employees to temporarily change their password to one that we had created. Of the 100 employees contacted, 71 agreed to compromise their password, effectively giving us access to IRS systems. 
The second challenge that I'd like to discuss is IRS's business systems modernization. This area is considered a significant risk due to its high cost, previous failures, and because many IRS reforms, such as improved debt collection, are backlogged, awaiting systems modernization. While the IRS has made some progress modernizing its systems, the overall pace of these efforts has been considerably slower than expected. To its credit, the IRS has begun implementing process improvements in such areas as configuration management, risk management, schedule and cost analysis, and quality assurance. However, these improvements are recent, and we have not yet seen major improvements in the actual application of these actions at the project level. As a result, the projects continue to experience significant delays and cost increases, with significant decreases in functionality. We attribute this to several factors, including the initiatives are still struggling with immature project management processes, the prime contractor has not consistently demonstrated the management and technical disciplines that it was hired to bring to the IRS. Requirements have continued to evolve, and lessons learned in previous projects are not being applied adequately to other similar projects and problems. Another significant issue facing the IRS is meeting its goal to provide quality service to taxpayers. At times, taxpayers need to go to IRS for assistance. My office has conducted reviews of the IRS's toll-free telephone operations and walk-in activities during this filing season. TIGTA auditors monitored 736 telephone calls and found IRS employees responded incorrectly to 22% of the questions. TIGTA auditors also visited 40 taxpayer assistance centers and asked 168 tax law questions. IRS employees provided 36 correct responses, 42 correct responses despite some procedural errors, 40 referrals to a publication in lieu of a response, and 50 incorrect responses. Another concern with serious implications for voluntary compliance is the well-known decline in enforcement activities at the IRS. During the past decade, the number of tax returns selected for examination by the IRS has decreased, while the number of tax returns filed by taxpayers has increased. Additionally, the number of liens, levies, and seizures, although up from the previous year, continue to be significantly fewer than in the past. The IRS is at a crucial point in its reinvention process. As Commissioner Rosati completes his term, the risks increase that IRS will not succeed in delivering its promised improvements. Commissioner Rosati's strategic planning and leadership skills, combined with his willingness to substantially change the IRS culture, have been instrumental in guiding the IRS to the successes it has achieved thus far. I'd be happy to answer any questions on these or any of the other management challenges. Thank you. Our last presenter is Nina E. Olson, the National Taxpayer Advocate, Internal Revenue Service. You might give us a little summary of what the National Taxpayer Advocate does. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today. Management and performance improvements are central to the service's ability to fairly administer the tax law and thus are of concern to the National Taxpayer Advocate. In our 2001 annual report to Congress, we identified the top 23 taxpayer problems and reasons taxpayers sought assistance from the Taxpayer Advocate Service, or TAS, in FY 2001. Each of these areas cry out for management and performance improvements. In many of them, the IRS already has improvement initiatives well underway and is monitoring performance on a continuing basis. In many areas, the IRS is working with TAS to learn from our experiences and our cases. In some areas, I do not believe change is happening quickly enough and taxpayer patience is sorely being tried. I believe this is the case with the Offer and Compromise pro Program, which ranked in both of our 2001 top 20 lists. Taxpayer problems included denials, delays in processing, and IRS requests for updated information. The current growth in the program and the resulting inventory backlog forces IRS management into a reactive mode and diverts our collection resources away from more productive work. However, Program improvement is not just about clearing out backlogs or processing cases faster. We must respect taxpayer rights in the process of doing so. Particularly when a program is operating under pressure, the momentum is there to go for a fix. TAS is sometimes the sole voice saying, you can't do that. Your proposal will have these consequences. The voice that makes all the planners stop and say, oh, right. 
Since coming on board the IRS, I have asked my colleagues to include representatives of my office on task forces, design teams, and project teams undertaking program improvements, particularly in the compliance area. These efforts have been met with mixed success, but we are working on it. Our efforts will be discussed in detail in my upcoming 2003 objectives report to Congress due on June 30th. I am pleased to report that TAS was invited to join the current team that is studying the collection contract support feasibility analysis. Inclusion makes sense since TAS watches out for the delicate balance between taxpayer rights and taxpayer compliance. Nowhere is this balance more difficult to achieve than in the area of collection contract support. As the national taxpayer advocate, I have concerns about using private contractors to collect government tax debt, including issues relating to taxpayer privacy, due process, and access to dispute resolution, including the Taxpayer Advocate Service. The power to assess and collect federal taxes is constitutionally prescribed. Thus, tax collection is an, an inherently governmental function. Federal tax collection is intimately related to the public interest and the public trust. Any delegation of this authority to private parties must be sufficiently circumscribed so as to ensure that this exercise of government power is neither arbitrary, discretionary, nor without procedural safeguards and the appropriate level of agency oversight. The responsibility and accountability for the collection of federal taxes must remain with the IRS. To this end, the IRS must maintain control of, on its internal systems of any case sent out to a contractor so that it has continued oversight of the cases. The taxpayer must be afforded all legal rights due him or her under the Internal Revenue Code and in accordance with IRS policies and procedures. This consideration alone may prove to limit private collection contractors' successes. Few state and private creditors are subject to the significant due process protections enjoyed by federal taxpayers in the post-RRA 98 era. My own personal experience with private contractors attempting to collect state tax debt has not been positive. In my former tax practice, which included a large number of collection cases, I continually struggled with private collection employees of different skill levels and expertise. It was difficult to get a case out of the hands of the collection agency and back into the tax authority for issue resolution. Many of my cases involved low-income taxpayers who were not represented when they negotiated payment arrangements with the private agencies. Contractors resisted revising inappropriate collection terms and agreements. I am, however, trying to keep an open mind on this issue, since I am very concerned about the current level of collections and the limited IRS resources available for the future collection of tax. It is clear that the service must not only articulate a comprehensive philosophy of tax collection, but we must also work smarter with respect to such collections. I am impressed with the approach that the feasibility study is taking, and I am pleased that through Taxpayer Advocate Service participation participation. Our concerns will be addressed up front as part of the study rather than after the fact. Mr. Chairman, thank you for providing me the opportunity to discuss my concerns with you today. Thank you. And we will now start the questioning. And I'm going to yield five minutes to uh, the uh, distinguished uh, Mrs. Thornton of uh, the delegate, delegate uh, to the Congress from the uh, District of Columbia. Thank you. Five minutes, and then I'll do five. She'll do five, so forth. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rizzotti, I want to want to thank you for uh, your responsiveness to me and to the residents of the District of Columbia when we had difficulties with the five thousand dollar home buyer credit, and we got all kinds of protest calls because this Congress has given the district this DC only tax credit to make sure that we make up for the. Uh, <clears throat> loss of population, the fact that we can't tax people who come here, and you were immediately responsive, and that, that of course, had to do with the, the uh, ATM, uh, AMT, um, alternative minimum tax. Um, you are, of course, aware that the 600,000 people who live in the nation's capital pay federal income taxes and have only me in the House, no senators. I vote in this committee and in all the committees on which I serve. I do not vote on the House floor. Increasingly, my constituents 
uh, obediently file their income tax returns, but file them under protest. Uh, I'm asking you whether or not a taxpayer who files under protest is more likely to be subject to an audit. Well, I think that what we look at is not uh, sort of what somebody's uh, thinking is, but what they actually do in filing their return. So as long as someone files a return and pays the taxes that are due, you know, that's really the only, only concern we have. I mean, the political debate about the tax code is part of our democracy, and, and you know we certainly understand that. Well, all the evidence does seem to point in that direction. I have filed my tax, taxes under protest for the last uh, several years, and have always gotten something back from the IRS. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad punished. to hear that. <laughs> I'm not being punished for yeah. it. I'd like to ask you about staffing. Uh, Ten years ago, the IRS had about 120,000 more or less. Today, it has about 100,000 more or less. Yeah. Uh, this committee, the, the full committee, the Government Reform Committee, has had joint hearings with the Government Affairs Committee of the Senate, the Comparable Committee. Uh, actually, uh, Senator Voinovich was chair of the committee at the time of those hearings. They were called because half of civil servants, apparently, throughout the government now could either retire on early, early retirement or could retire. So there is great concern, a uh, bipartisan concern in the government now that after all the downsizing, we, may, we ought to do something to make sure we don't prematurely lose people with special expertise. I don't need to tell you about the new technology uh, deficit expertise uh, we have. Is the IRS facing uh, uh, particular problems uh, with staffing at a time when government work has not seemed to be as sexy, if you'll forgive the expression, as going to, to other kinds of employment, especially in private business? I think the answer, the short answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, but I think it, it, it comes in two categories, if I could say them. One category just has to do with the total level of staffing, which is driven by our budget. Seventy percent of our budget supports salaries and benefits. That's basically the only two things we have in the IRS are people and computers. They both are necessary. Um, the staffing is the, by far the biggest cost. And because of budget limitations uh, over the last, say, 10 years, actually, it goes back a long time, there's been a steady erosion of the staffing. You're quite right. The, the staffing is about 15,000 uh, staff years uh, less than it was uh, in the early 90s. You know, at the same time, we've continued to have increased numbers of returns filed. So just from a pure uh, numbers standpoint, it has gone down. Um, and then the other point is where it has gone down, and, the, and I think the other part of your point is the skills of specific people. Unfortunately, where it's gone down the most is where it had to, because it's where most of the people are, was in our compliance operations, our skilled accountants, our skilled collectors, our, our tax auditors, our people that uh, really understand um, the issues that come up when people don't necessarily report correctly and so forth. Uh, the reason that that has gone down the most is because that's where most of the money is in the IRS budget. Um, and it's also the place where you have some limited discretion on a year-to-year -year basis. I mean, essentially, the people that are in the back office processing the returns, we have to process the returns. If, if you sent in your return, um, and you didn't get your refund back, or your constituents didn't, uh, that, would be, that would be impossible. So as the total goes down, the only place you can really take it out of is in things like where you're doing auditing and collections. Um, and then looking forward, finally, to the future, we do have the point that the skill levels, um, the, the skilled people are the ones that, um, that are the hardest to, to, to replace. Now, Having said all that background, let me say that um, beginning in 2001, we did come in, fiscal 2001, we did come into the Congress and request some funds to begin to turn around in a very slight way the staffing. We did get some of that funding, and we have, as a result uh, in the last year, begun to go out into the market and hire accountants and skilled people for the first time in six years. I mean, for about six years, there was essentially no hiring of any kind for permanent staff. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the results of that were very good. I, I mean, we may have been fortunate in the timing of the economy in that, you know, the high economy was, was weaker relatively than it was in previous years. And 
we have done a lot of innovative things to make, the, make it clear that, that it really is an attractive opportunity to come and work for the IRS. Uh, we have very, very important work to do. We, we are drastically revamped our training programs for new employees. Uh, we have improved uh, some of the tools, even though the technology is old, some of the at least personal tools that we give to employees have improved. And we got some very, very good people uh, last year. What is important, however, is that we continue this because it's not a one-shot deal. We have to hire people every year. We hope that uh, we will get the funding in 03 that will allow us to hire. And if you noted the chart, I think you have the chart in front of you we put up that showed the the program, what we're trying to do is to hire, especially in the compliance area, and offset that with some efficiency improvements. So basically, my view is that we, we absolutely must have the, the operational funds as well as the modernization funds to at least incrementally uh, hire the skilled people we need, especially for the compliance functions. Uh, this is complementary to our modernization effort, not in, in lieu of it, and without that, uh, some of the negative trends that were noted in the chairman's opening statement will, will, will not be reversed, or at least they will not be reversed fast enough. My time is five, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. And uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Brostek on my five minutes. Uh, people often consider the management challenges you described at the technical sort of green eye shade issues that have no real consequences. Can you provide some examples of how the management problems at IRS directly affect the average American taxpayer? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, some of the performance shortfalls that we heard uh, myself and other witnesses describe today I think are attributable at least in part to the need to, to tighten up some management processes. For instance, we heard about the number of people who receive incorrect answers to their questions. Uh, we know that there are a number of people who try to get through to IRS and have difficulty doing that. Uh, the level of performance there has been increasing, but it's not yet to the world-class standards that IRS would like to achieve. Those are the types of performance shortfalls that directly affect taxpayers. You point out that the IRS is not pursuing about $12 billion in tax delinquencies because of resource limitations. Do you believe that the Internal Revenue Service should take the necessary steps to use the private sector resources to pursue those debts? Well, first, Mr. Chairman, let me say that uh, resource limitations play a role in that. There are also, uh, again, management questions that uh, come into play. Uh, the efficiency with which the resources are used is an important factor as well, and we have noticed a decline in the productivity of the, of the collection staff. Uh, on the other hand, uh, yes, it's always prudent to consider all the options that are available for in improving the efficiency of an organization, and to the extent that private debt collection might offer that as an opportunity, it's a reasonable thing to consider. Uh, the General Accounting Office, as you know, has uh, done uh, a number of debt collection practices uh, by various federal agencies, including the use of the private collection agencies. Do you believe the most p federal agencies have benefited from using private collection agencies? And are you aware of any abusive practices by the private firms in pursuing federal debts? Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough about the range of work that we've done to give you a definitive answer to that question. I could get back to you. Uh, sure. Without uh, objection, be put at this point in the record. Uh, when we had that situation uh, five, six years ago, uh, the, uh, and this was before Commissioner Rosati's time, uh, they had a phony operation is what they were. They had five years where nothing had happened while you and I and everybody in this room pay their taxes, and they let them get away with these people that are simply uh, doing everything in the works to not pay their taxes. I think that's an outrage, and I think anybody that doesn't want private collectors, they better tell me a better way to do it, because Mr. and Mrs. Average Citizen, and I'm one of them, is I pay my taxes. And uh, to see, and that's what started me on this whole thing, uh, back in uh, Mrs. Maloney and I, back in 96, uh, where we went after debt that nobody was doing anything about. And they had 100 billion sitting there before Commissioner Rosati got there. And uh, 
I just think, uh, Ms. Solson, I just disagree with you. And I think it's an outrage that we don't do that. And I think you've got a very good group. Laguna Niguel is an ombudsman role. But I would suggest that uh, you're not doing the public interest any good when you're letting scoundrels go at bay. So uh, that's so much for that. And uh, let's go back to another one uh, on your, uh, Mr. Brostek. Uh, do, you, do you have any data in the uh, General Accounting Office that most federal agencies have benefited from using private collection agencies? Mr. Rubin, or Secretary Rubin, really knew what he was doing when he was secre uh, Treasury Secretary. Uh, he asked every single agency he could find to send that debt over to the Treasury. And we made some progress as a result of that. Uh, again, un unfortunately, I'm not prepared to, to uh, comment on the breadth of the GAO's work on this. My understanding is that we've had uh, some uh, mixed experiences with private debt collection, but I can get back to you with more details on that. Okay, that's uh, fine. Uh, well, my uh, time has expired here. We'll now give Ms. Norton five minutes. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Rosati, or whoever among you is best qualified to answer this question, uh, we are all aware that audits of, uh, uh, by the IRS um, um, were increased uh, very little, and the increase was uh, among low-income taxpayers who file the simplest returns. Um, taxpayers with incomes of more than $100,000 apparently had their rates of auditing lowered rather substantially. Now, as I understand it, the return to the IRS uh, from uh, an audit of a lower income taxpayer is $2,577 compared to $4,567 for a high income taxpayer. My question is, has this large change in who gets audited uh, had a notable uh, effect on decrease in revenue? Uh, and what is that effect? Yes. What is um, that effect? On, on revenue, there has been over the past, uh, since 1997, with the decline in, in audits, there has been some decline in what's called enforcement revenue, um, uh, which is the amount that is collected from specific enforcement action by the IRS. That did turn around last year. It did level off last year, which was our goal. It was about level in 1990, uh, in 2001, over 2000. How did it level off if you were continuing to audit low-income uh, taxpayers? Well, um, more than more yeah, than higher-income taxpayers. I think that one of the important things. For, well, first, let me just say what what we're trying to do, okay? Because I think this is important. Before we get too wound up in the statistics, is that um, there 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 is we have as our strategy. Um, as uh, and in our performance plan to increase the, the relative auditing of upper income taxpayers because 62 percent of the in and it's just because that's where the money is 62 percent of the income in this country is um, is income taxes paid by individuals over a hundred thousand dollars and yeah, it's, as the it same is now, reason, it's the same reason that people go to banks to rob banks that's where the money is that there there is more okay and and the coverage the, the coverage of, of upper income taxpayers is still substantially higher um, than it is for, for, for lower income taxpayers, uh, although it has declined over the years. But I think the other important point to, to make is that audits are not audits. I mean, we count them as one statistic, but when we audit upper income taxpayers, it's typically done with a field audit where it may take uh, several weeks of time to actually go and look at the taxpayers' books and records. But it even, turns out to be worth the time when you get more than two thousand. Absolutely, more. and 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 whereas most of the, uh, for example, earned income type audits are just a letter that we send to a taxpayer. It all counts as one audit, but but it's not really it's not really comparable. What is I think most important is what I think Mr. Levitan alluded to is that we target the auditing that we do. I mean, we have a limited set of resources. And the important thing is to put them where they're going to be, do the most good, where the potential noncompliance is the greatest. And that is why we do intend and are working very hard to increase the, um, the targeting of our limited audit resources, especially our most expensive resources, which is our field auditing, to 
to the upper income brackets. It takes over a year to complete an, uh, a field audit. So what, what, what you see in the statistics is what was started a year, more than a year or even a year and a half ago. Um, and, and it was only really in about the, you know, when we really got, uh, got some information that, that helped us do this, it was only about, I think it was in, in 2000, that we really began to put our strategic plan in place and, 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 and retarget our resources. And you really will see that a little bit in this current year, but mostly in 2003 is when you will actually see the change, which, and the change will be um, an increase in the uh, attention to where the money is, the upper income taxpayers. Um, now, I will say this, okay, that there is a special appropriation that we have for the earned income credit, which in effect fences that money. There's $146 million a year, which is specifically appropriated for tax administration. And not, it's not all for auditing, but the largest percentage of it is for auditing. And so that portion of the work will continue as long as Congress continues to fund that. It will continue at the same level. But for the rest of the money that we have, what we, what we are going to be doing is, is focusing a greater percentage of that on the upper income taxpayers. Could, it, 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 what, what is the figure for the loss and enforcement revenue from the the change in who get and who got audited in the last. Well, well, let, let me just say, it was not. It was not so much only from that. There was a lot of other things that were going on, including RRA and. Yeah, but I'm were, interested in. But it was uh, from the high point in 1997 or 1998 to the low point. It was about three billion dollars a year, a drop of about three billion dollars a year in enforcement revenue. That was from. That was not just from auditing. That was from everything. But I do want to point out that it did turn around or it did level off as we go last year, and we hope to get but that. But most of that would have been from, from auditing. Well, it would have been from auditing as well as collections, um, and it was not all individual taxpayers. It would include some corporate audits and so forth, too. It was from all Let's sources. Let's move to another question, and it will be uh, to Mr. Levitan, the uh, chairman of the uh, Internal Revenue Service Oversight Board. In your testimony, Mr. Levitan, you cited a survey which shows that one quarter of United States citizens admit that it is okay to cheat on their taxes. That's very troubling. What should be done to alter this? Uh, we need to, uh, to I mean, change. I, I find it hard to believe because usually the IRS has a pretty good uh, feeling around the country that, hey, they are after taxes and uh, you can't cheat at them. Right. Uh, there are a number of things that can be done, uh, and the IRS uh, can and should and is doing some of those. First of all, the IRS needs to do a more effective job of using the resources that they have to, to do the most effective enforcement that they possibly can. Uh, such things as the National Research Project will give them a lot better research information so they can allocate their resources much more effectively, and we think that's important. Uh, number two, and this particularly focuses on the higher income uh, taxpayers, uh, the IRS is just initiating a program to do information matching for K-1 returns, the pass-through income on partnerships and other types of income. We believe the IRS should move very aggressf aggressively in, uh, in this program. We think there's significant uh, potential. Number three, the IRS should do an even more uh, effective job of publicizing uh, cases where they are going after and catching tax cheats and aggressively uh, prosecuting them. That has already that has started. It is in place, but it can be particularly effective as we focus on some of the newer, more high potential areas or areas that are getting publicity, such as the use of, uh, of foreign credit cards. So the I, so there are certainly things that the IRS can do to uh, to send a message out that they are efficient and effective collectors of the taxes. Mr. Chairman, after saying all of that, and there are others, I have to tell you that in our opinion, that's just playing around the edges. The IR, what the IRS can do to become a more efficient and effective collector of those taxes is just marginal. 
There's a lot more that Congress can do that can impact that. And there are two things in particular that I think should be, uh, should be acknowledged. One of them is the pure complexity of the tax code. Uh, the complexity of the tax code invites errors which take tremendous resources. It invites cheating uh, because it's easier to cheat when the tax code is so complex. Uh, number two, uh, is resources. Until the IRS has adequate resources to do right. enough enforcement, then they're not going to do enough enforcement. Uh, as, uh, as Ms. Norton mentioned earlier, the uh, resources have uh, been reduced over the past decade by about 17 percent. A significant amount of that has come from enforcement. As long as the IRS's uh, resources for this are at an inadequate level, we're going to have an inadequate amount of enforcement, and many taxpayers will feel that they can get away with cheating. I have a, a question about uh, the fencing off of the uh, earned income tax credit uh, matter that you mentioned, Commissioner Rosati. Uh, um, every year, I and I hope other members of Congress go out of our way to publicize and popularize the earned income tax credit uh, in one of the landmark uh, pieces of legislation, uh, tax legislation, if we were to look over, I think, the, 20, the 20th century, we would, we would put it in that category. Um, and the whole purpose of popularizing this is because lower income people are those least likely to know about it or to, to, to care about taxes. They uh, you know, pay few taxes. Uh, when they pay taxes, they can't believe it. Uh, they simply pay them. Uh, and uh, when they learn that you can get something back from the government, of course, this has been taken up. So there's a great deal of activity uh, that goes on to popularize this. So I'd like to know if, if uh, your audits have to do with the fact that a great deal more money may be uh, going to uh, taxpayers and others because of the EITC? Is it because of cheating? Uh, by people on the EITC? Is it because of mistakes made by people? What will you be looking for in these yeah. audits of, okay. l of l most disadvantaged people sure. in the society? Sure. No, you raised some very good points, and we're very actively working on all those points now. But I do want to clarify one point. Of the appropriations we have for the Earned Income Program, it's about $146 million a year. It's not all for auditing. As a matter of fact, um, part of it is spent even on advertising. We only have two areas that we're allowed to do paid advertising in the IRS. One is to promote electronic filing, and the other is to promote the earned income credit. If you've noticed some of the TV ads, which we have an advertising yes. agency, they've gotten good reviews, uh, better than they were the previous year. Um, and, and we are interested in, that's not the only method. We have a whole partnership outreach program which we've accelerated significantly in the last part, part of our reorganization. We have a group of people throughout the country that's called Partnership Education and Communication and they work with local community groups and uh, we've had very good success in some of the big cities working with uh, mayors and others to try to get the word out um, so that people who are eligible will promote. And that is part of our mission, it is part of our goal. The other side to it is that, regrettably, there is a high error rate in the, in the earned income program. We finished the study based on the uh, returns that were filed in fiscal 2000, and it showed, depending on how you look at it, that about uh, 25, 30 percent, I'll just use round numbers, of the claims were, were incorrect. Are when I say filling out their own, their own Well, claims? actually, about 60 percent of the people use pre preparers to prepare, and it's interesting that the preparer prepared returns aren't any more accurate than the individually prepared returns, which is one of the points. We've spent part of our money trying to educate preparers. But the taxpayer advocate, you know, um, Nina here that's with us, has done a fantastic job in, in explaining in her report the unbelievably intricate 
definitions that exist in, in not only the Earned Income Credit Program, but in other programs that are related to it, such as the definition of what's ahead of a household, uh, whether you're married or not. You know, and, and I, you could laugh at this, and, and, and you would laugh if it weren't so serious, because the intricate definitions that are, and the conflicting ones that are embedded in the tax code that tells somebody, under these circumstances, this is what a child is, under these circumstances, this is what a child is, here's how you determine whether you're married or not, you know, this is, this, is, this is something that anybody could get confused at. So part of it is confusion. We have no way to separate, really, whether when someone makes an error on a return, whether it was deliberate or whether it was a We just, you know, we've tried to think. Of, we, we can tell whether there was an error, but we can't really tell Are there tell more why. errors on these returns than on the average return, let's say? Well, uh, the other problem is we don't have the research on the other returns. It does appear that there is a higher error rate, but we don't really have a comparable set of numbers on other kinds of returns. But I, th I think the important point is what do we do about it? We, 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 we got approval from Secretary O'Neill um, a few months back. I announced this at other hearings to really take a whole look at this program. And, I'm, and, and we have a working group that is working with Treasury um, and with components of the IRS, including the taxpayer advocate, to look at the entire program and see if there's a way that we can reduce this error rate because it's gotten a lot of attention and it is something that, you know, no one really finds acceptable, to the, and do that in such a way that it will also be easier, if possible, easier for taxpayers to understand the program. Um, it's hard to reconcile. Some of those can be achieved by simplifying definitions, but some of them may also require some additional steps to help tax, verify taxpayers' returns. So it's, it's a hard balance to achieve. But my objective in this program, which has been supported by the Secretary, is to try to come up with a better way to do it, whatever that means. Okay, it may mean and probably would mean recommending some legislative changes, which Treasury would have to do to simplify some of these definitions. And it's not that we don't know how to do it, because several people have studied it, especially Ms. Olson here, studied it very well. And we know how we could do some things. but you know, getting that done is hard. It may require some additional certification steps or something where somebody could send in a piece of paper with us. We're a lot better, you know, at matching documents up than we are at trying to probe people's personal household situations. Um, and I think if we can find a way to convert that to something that is, um, you know, easier to verify, maybe we can come up with something that will really stabilize this program for its objectives and, and still achieve the objective of of getting a lower error rate. So we're really, we're really working on this, and it's not a 10-year pro. We, we have a goal within four months to come up with a set of recommendations on this. Um, now, admittedly, we haven't developed them yet, so I, I don't want to extend expectations at too high a level. But, but what I can tell you is that nothing is off the table. We've given carte blanche by the Secretary to look at all possible things that we could recommend. We have very good cooperation from the Tax Policy Office. And we're going to see if we can come up with something that is, um, that is better than what we've got now. Mr. Chairman, could I just ask Mr. Rosati if, he, if, if you could, by the time we go to the public the next time, if you could, it, it's, very, it's, it's, it's very good to hear you saying you're giving this priority, to have them out the next time so that Congress can see uh, and so that the public can see that, that this error rate is going down. I think it's important for, 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 for the uh, continuation of the program. I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite understand your question. Your, if you will have recommendations in four months, right. for which I congratulate you, Well, we hope. I, 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 would, I would like to urge that by the time we get to the next tax filing season, at least some of those recommendations be in order so that we might begin to lower this well, error rate well, and, and continue. I'm, I'm okay. afraid that some people hearing that the program is under this kind of scrutiny may not may not even want to want to file anymore for it. Uh, we oh, don't no, want to be a compete, sure. competing with well, one another. No, on this. no, I don't think anyone should take away that. The program is in effect. It's continuing in effect. We're continuing to advertise it. We're continuing to explain, but we're also trying to work on how to get the error rate down. I mean, whether we can get things in place for next filing season, that's that's going to be maybe some of them. Um, but first, we have to get the recommendations out, um, and some of them. I think almost certainly are going to be legislative. I, I don't think this is a problem, you know, I, I really don't think this is a problem that we in the IRS internally can solve on our own. Uh, I just don't think we can. We, if we really want to solve it in a way that's, that's meaningful, we're going to have to look more broadly at, at better, better options. But I will say this, the objective that the Secretary has given us for this study is to how to make the program work better, you know, from an administrative and, and legislative standpoint, not to uh, abandon the objectives of the program. 
I'll give myself 10 minutes to I'm sorry. get this, uh, so we'll pick up the extra my colleague has had. And I want to get back to uh, the one quarter of U.S. citizens admit that it's okay to cheat. We had the uh, views of the oversight chairman. We've had the views to be filed by GAO. And I'd like to see, uh, Mr. Commissioner, as to what do you think we should do with this in order to make that difference of that we can simply cheat on our taxes. I do want to make one, uh, put one more little detail uh, into this discussion that I think is important is that, and I believe this was true in the uh, most recent study that the Oversight Board did, that is that, is that uh, it's interesting, they subdivided it further. You know, I think it was 76 percent said that it wasn't acceptable to cheat at all, but then there was the question of how much cheating would be acceptable, and most people said that only a little would be acceptable. Now, that's not great, but it's better than the 3 or 5 percent who said that any anything goes. Um, so you really have three categories, and this really, I think, is consistent with my experience, is that most people really are remarkably meticulous in this country about wanting to file correctly. At the other extreme, you have some, you know, outright cheats that just say, you know, uh, I'll get away with anything I can. And we're getting a lot more information about some of those, by the way, through some initiatives that we've recently undertaken to, for example, track down people who put money in offshore bank accounts, which is a bigger problem than we might have thought. But then you got this middle ground um, of people who really are influenceable. You know, in, in business, where I came from before, we used to think about the, the part of the market that we could influence. You know, you had some people that were already in your market and some people that were outside your market. And then you had the group in the middle. So I think what that says uh, is that we need an array of approaches to solve this problem. For those that are in the majority, what we need to do, the set, whether it be 76 percent or 83 percent that really are trying to pay, we need to treat them, you know, as well as we possibly can, and that's why service is so important. You know, they can make errors too. I mentioned the complexity of the tax code. Even if you're trying as hard as you can, you can still make an error in your tax return. We don't want to treat everybody like they were a tax cheat. So the majority of them. They are, God bless them, you know, doing everything they can to pay their taxes. We need to do a better job than we are doing now. In, 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 in. At the other extreme, the people who are really the outright cheats, you know, we're really focusing up higher on those. I mean, we, one of the things that we have at our disposal is our criminal investigation division. This is a very powerful tool. When I came in, we uh, asked Judge Webster, who was the former director of the FBI, to look at, look at our criminal investigation division to find out what we should do about that. Um, and his recommendation was this is a very fine organization. They are. They're fine investigators. They had lost drift in their mission and gotten off into narcotics and other kinds of crimes which really have nothing to do with the tax system. The only people who can, who can prosecute tax cheating is the IRS. So we are refocusing our criminal investigation division on those people, that small percentage that are really the outright cheaters and especially the upper income cheaters. And I will say that one of the things that we've done that's seemingly going to be an unbelievably successful initiative along that line is a set of summonses that we have issued to three of the major credit card companies in this country to get the records of people who are using credit cards issued in a whole number of tax haven countries to just hide income. And we are finding out that there are large numbers, much larger numbers than we might have thought of people that are doing that. And these are not $2,000, $3,000 cheaters. These are people that are in the upper income brackets. And through both civil and criminal, we are going to do everything we can to, to find those folks and um, uh, track, down, uh, track them down and, and prosecute them either criminally or audit them civilly. And that will be our top priority, as well as going after the promoters who are promoting those kinds of schemes. So that's at the other extreme. That's the people who are the, the real cheaters that I think make all of us angry and upset. Then you've got this middle ground of people, and that's, that's a little more complex. You need a range of tools for those. I think that some of it is auditing um, to make it clear that you know, no one is able to get away with even small cheating um, over a period of time. But we can't and never would have the resources to audit everybody that makes a small mistake on their tax return. The other thing on that middle ground is we need, and Mr. Levitan mentioned this, we need to do a better job, and this is part of our reorganization, to get the word out to people, to warn off people not to get sucked into schemes or to make mistakes. And this is something that is new. We're devoting a relatively small amount of resources, but we think it's highly leveraged to um, things like working with uh, professional societies uh, to get the word out to them that they shouldn't uh, fall for these schemes and things like that. So you have 
you have really a whole range of tools that we're trying to apply that is appropriate. Now, the way I look at it is it's, it's very much like a, in, in, even though it's a funny kind of thing to apply in business, it's understanding your market. If you understand what your market is, your taxpayer, your customers, how they're behaving, why they're behaving, you can use the appropriate mechanisms to reach those taxpayers. In our case, in some cases, that mechanism is to prosecute them and put them in jail. And in other cases, it's to warn them off of temptation. Um, and in other cases, they're doing just fine the way they are. We just have to help them make sure they get the tax returns done correctly. Let us uh, get the opinion of uh, Pamela Gardner, Deputy Inspector General for Audit under the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. What uh, would you and the Inspector General for Tax Administration uh, propose to get people conscious that uh, it doesn't pay to cheat? Well, I, I agree with I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, uh, certainly, um, some other things that, that the Criminal Investigation Division is doing successfully is um, to publicize some of its successes so that people know that IRS is out there, it's active, and it is catching tax cheats. Um, we, we often hear that um, the average American believes that the wealthy um, you know, hire expensive attorneys and, and CPAs to, to get away with tax fraud. And um, the fact that this credit card initiative is underway, I think, um, will help with that. Um, better use of technology. Um, the National Research Program should help with that to just uh, help IRS identify the, the most effective way to go after um, tax cheats or, or, like they said, just people that make um, mistakes. And then probably... Um, the 1203 is still a lingering problem for many IRS employees and, and um, addressing that. And I think with that, uh, time will tell th that employees are being more convinced now that uh, the repercussions that they originally thought they were going to have to pay as a result of the, you know, the ted 10 deadly sins um, really haven't come to bear, that, that there aren't employees being fired every five minutes like they thought they were going to be if they made a simple mistake. And so I think those fears are diminishing, and that should help as well. Uh, Nina Olson, National Taxpayer Advocate, uh, what would your office uh, think about uh, focusing a little more on the uh, idea that you can get away with not filing your taxes, you can cheat and all this? What, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think, in, you know, in my annual report, I spoke about my concern about the complexity of the code, making people just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, I can't figure this out and I'm going to do whatever just makes sense to me. And often what makes sense to a taxpayer is directly and, you know, antipodal to what the code is requiring you to do. I think complexity has a fair part of that. I also think that the lack of street presence, you know, in enforcement, uh, gives, creates an environment in which people feel it is okay to do those little tiny cheatings um, where you go into a grocery store on your corner and you know that the person is running a second cash register or you hire someone to paint your house and you're paying them and you know that that person is being paid in cash and that's not showing up on somebody's tax return. They're not getting a 1099 from you. So there's no way we catch it. And that sort of thing lets people say when they go into their prepares, well, I don't have all of my receipts, but I think I spend about, you know, $25 or $100 a month on office supplies. And the tax return prepare says, okay, you know, and that just, that, that whole environment, you know, it's going to be impossible to audit that, but we have to create an, a, an atmosphere where that's not okay, where what you're looking at is that you're robbing someone else when you do those tiny little cheats. Um, I am concerned about preparers, and this goes to Congresswoman Norton's earlier questions about the earned income credit environment. It is a stunning statistic that m more than half of the people who claim the earned income credit are using preparers and that that an enormous number of those returns are in fact filed incorrectly. Um, and, and my office in particular 
views return preparers either as the last stop for these kinds of little cheating, certainly for the larger cheating, but for the little cheating, as well as enablers. And depending on how they interview their clients, depending on the questions that they ask, depending on their expertise and education in tax, you know, that's whether you get the, the errors or not. And so my office is looking actively and about to make recommendations about a, a registration an education requirement and a certification requirement for return preparers so that taxpayers know when they're going into their preparer that that person has some base level of understanding of the code. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the 1203 to me, although I think it was, it has been painted as something draconian um, and there are certainly structural changes that can be made to it, and we've had some recommendations in the most recently reported bill. I've always looked at 1203 as a professional responsibility provision. As a lawyer, I'm held accountable for my actions, and I think that if it's, if it's talked correctly up, to our employees, that our employees over time will understand that actually it's, it's the basis, it's, it's the, the baseline for your professional behavior to taxpayers. Thank you. And we'll go back to the five-minute rule now. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Rosati, could I thank you again for the participation of IRS personnel in my own tax day where uh, um, we filled out the tax forms, could not have done so without the help of the IRS, the Finance and Revenue of the District, also many of the volunteers. 400 people had their tax forms filled, filled out free of charge. We thought that's the least I should do for my own constituents. Uh, I said to them, I don't think you should, pay, you should have to pay in order to pay the government. Uh, Mr. Rosati, I am, I, I, uh, let me thank you as well for appearing with me. Uh, you and the U.S. Attorney here in this Capitol at a press conference designed to warn people off of these reparation uh, tax credits, taking uh, uh, gross advantage of people who believe that they're going to or were entitled to a tax credit uh, of some kind as a result of slavery in the United States. Um, I was stunned, however, to learn that more than 100,000 tax returns um, had been, had paid out more than $30 million just in 2000 and 2001. And I know that these were not the first years in which the scam was uh, going on. That, and of course, uh, there was a IRS employee who was reported uh, to have gotten from the IRS more than $43,000, a figure that comes from a magazine article uh, pathetically talking about 40 acres and a mule, and that's what African Americans would be entitled to. As you know, there is a bill for reparations, uh, for a study of reparations, uh, and that bill is only in the House, has gotten, has not gotten a hearing, and there's no bill in the Senate. Um, uh, According to the press, the reparation, the claims for the reparation, the so-called reparation credit totaled $2.7 billion right. in 2001. I, first, I have to ask you, how was this discovered? Uh, how did we, how, how did you finally uh, get on to it? Yeah. And, and uh, secondly, I've got to ask you, what did they file under? Okay. Surely they didn't say I'm filing for my reparation, my slavery reparation credit. Well, uh, that's actually, I didn't bring this particular, I have some examples in my last hearing and I could give them to you, uh, some redacted examples. The, the, the answer is they file under a variety of different things, which is one of the things that makes it. Sometimes they file amended tax returns, sometimes they put a line on a tax return. I saw one where they actually uh, even dummied up a uh, alleged uh, um, 1098 form that showed that they had gotten uh, a, a taxes withheld for this. There's a whole variety of schemes, which is why occasionally some slip through. And it's true, uh, the report that you heard that, you know, roughly about, remember, they tend to charge about 40, they tend to claim about $40,000, sometimes $80,000 or even more. So any one claim, you know, when you multiply them by 90,000 claims, that's how you get up to the $2.7 billion. And I think we were successful, if I remember the numbers correctly, at stopping about about 99 percent of them, but you know there was maybe one percent that got through uh, because they were not 
uh, claimed always in the same way, and some 1%, of them. One percent at two point seven billion dollars in two thousand one. Oh, that that that's the claim. I guess. That's the claim. So so the point is is that most of them probably up as close maybe I as see. many as ninety nine percent we were able to find and stop before we ever sent them out. And Thirty million got sent out. Yeah, which is maybe a little over one percent. And 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 even then, I will say that we do go after those as with all erroneous refunds. We do try to get them back, and in many cases, we have been able to get them back. Commissioner, but, can we put an exhibit in for with Mrs. Norton? I will be glad to give you some examples of Thank how you, they Mr. do this. Thank you. Yes, th there's one thing I do want to note that, that is, is really, I think, uh, at all, although we don't have the final numbers in this, an excellent success story. The work that we did with you, you remember, in the press conference, we did with a number of other members, and we had a whole set of media events to try to warn people off. And it appears that from the results we've gotten so far this year, that we've the number of these claims that we've received has gone down maybe as much as 90 percent over the last year uh, as a result Did of that. Did you find this out through audits or some other process? We, we have people in the, in, as the returns are, uh, not, no, audits is after the fact. Our goal is to stop them before they're sent out. So we have a screening process that we use um, to screen the returns as they come in to look for these things. And it has been uh, partially a training process for people that code these returns. And also now, actually with the help of the IG, we're, we're putting in some, some computer screening uh, programs. So it's partly it's a- It's a $43,000 credit. I mean, I, I look at how you, I'm, I'm trying to educate myself as to how you audit. Is, is that a fairly large credit to be oh, getting oh yeah. back from the government? Sure, it you know, would be. It you would be. think that that would have signaled yeah. it, it anybody does. who saw it that it does. let's look more closely it, at it. Exactly, it does. And, and that's p partly why, we, why we've been able to note, uh, d discover these. Um, we have a variety of techniques. I don't want to go into too much detail about exactly how we find them, but, but it's a combination of training people who review the returns, uh, computer processing, and um, and, and really the goal is not to do auditing on these because we don't want to send out this money and then have to get it back. The goal is to, is to stop it. And, and we have been reasonably successful considering the statistics, but we deal with such huge numbers that even if you get a 1% error rate, you know, it still amounts to a significant amount of money that is lost. Um, what I think is, is, is most gratifying to me, if it holds up, which it so far seems to be, is that this year, right now, in the, the season that's just finishing, it appears that the number of these claims has gone down drastically over previous years, and that's because of the publicity and the and the educational effort that was undertaken by uh, a cooperative effort of the IRS and members of Congress and other people. So it appears that that is working uh, this year. I, I will say that the history of these schemes is they come and go. If we've educated people now and they've gone away and we've gotten 90 percent of them down, maybe we'll do the same thing next year. And uh, you know, it, it, somebody will come up with some new wrinkle two years from now or three years from now. So we have to be constantly on the alert for these things. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be leaving. Could I ask one more question since yeah. I won't have another round? Uh, I am very concerned, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Rosati, about preparers who uh, promise instant refunds. Uh, of course, these are loans. They are rampant particularly among in lower income neighborhoods and yeah. people rush yeah. to file with people who promise them they will get their money back within a week without telling them they will get that this money in fact yeah. is a loan at a very high rate of interest. Uh, you have done a very good job on, on slavery and I, uh, EITC. I have not noticed yeah. uh, this comparable, well, a comparable job done yeah. on these so-called instant refunds. They call different things, but yeah, that's the rapid what loans. they promise. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, those are, those, uh, say, those are, unlike the other things, those are legal. Um, I, I think that the, uh, that we the only want information. They're legal, and yeah. people really need to, to, to yeah. borrow money at that in order sure. to get it fined. But sure. somebody needs to tell people what the yeah. rate of interest. Th there should is. be full disclosure. There should be full disclosure. Maybe let us look into that. But I do want to tell you about one thing that is going to kill that practice. Uh, although it's going to take a couple more years, but it's just going to kill it off. Which is our modernization program, and the reason is that when we, the reason it takes a long time, even if you file electronically, it may take three weeks still to get your refund, is because of the long time in the back office processing tapes and so forth. As we begin to introduce our new taxpayer database, for those who have clean returns, and I stress clean returns because if there's a problem, we still may take longer, we're going to get that down to a couple of days, a few days, three, four, three, and so that will, that will kill that practice. Put them out of business. And put, put that out of business. Uh, that, that's that's going to take a couple more years to get in, but 
but really that's the solution. I mean, there's no reason why it should take so long to get the returns, uh, the refunds out. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me ask you about the degree to which the uh, Internal Revenue Service has been able to help find out where the so-called 501c3s that are really terrorist of gain, gaining money and going there. And you mentioned some mm -hmm. of these overseas right. Right. havens. And uh, how are we on that? Are you specifically talking about the the 501c3s that are that that were involved in the terrorist act funding terrorist right. act? Yeah. Well, that has been a Treasury initiative, and the IRS actually was participating actively in those task forces. Uh, I can only limit myself to what's been in the press, but you've seen some press reports of certain search warrants and certain things that have been uh, certain criminal investigations that have been publicized uh, on some of those uh, charitable organizations, and and. While that hasn't been exclusively an IRS job because it's been Treasury-wide, in many cases the Customs Service has actually led that, um, the IRS Criminal Investigation Division has been involved uh, with that. Um, there is a counterterrorism task force that the IRS is, participates in, and I believe that the um, uh, Treasury IG participates in that as well. Um, in looking at the intelligence, the leads uh, for any group that is funding terrorists. The Treasury's job is primarily following the money. So that terrorism task force finds those where there's a money issue, and then they assign that out to whoever's the best qualified agency to actually investigate it and, um, and follow up on it. And um, so we have been very, obviously, that has been an extremely high priority and has gotten everything that it, they've asked for in that regard. It's had some considerable success. Well, another area that is really comes under tax policy, and that is when we see American firms going overseas, putting thousands of people out of jobs and uh, going to uh, some uh, authoritarian country. And it just uh, bothers me that the Treasury hasn't said, you know, we could just slow that one down if we didn't let them bring the money back in some way or were uh, uh, in going after what's left of them and maybe giving them a little uh, uh, idea to uh, get some uh, individuals uh, who uh, would maybe slow that down and save jobs in America. Is anybody working on that? Well, as you noted, that's really a tax policy treasury issue, yeah. and so I'm not in a position to comment on that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, let's go a few things you are competent to deal with. <laughs> One uh, of the key attributes you'd like, would you like to see in your successor? I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't hear the question. Well, what are the key attributes oh, you'd like to see in your successor? Okay. Well. Um, I, I give you my views. I, I, th I think that at, at bottom, basically, the, the, this role of Commissioner of the IRS is primarily a leadership job. I mean, you know, what you have is a lot of people, internal 100,000 employees, externally millions of taxpayers, but even more so, we have many constituencies, we have committees of Congress, we have taxpayer groups, trying to keep all that aligns in moving forward in a positive direction is probably the most challenging part of the whole job. Um, and what it really is, is is trying to articulate and, and listen to especially the concerns that people have and reconcile them in some way so that you don't have people flying off in every different direction. That is quite a difficult uh, thing and I think is probably the most important thing. Um, then, beyond that, I will say that we do have uh, we do have a major technology challenge in the IRS. Um, there's just no question about it. I mean, um, it, for a variety of reasons which we won't go into, it's it's one of the harder things to do. Uh, you have to joke about you know changing the airplanes on the plane while you're still flying and all those kind of analogies. It's 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 not something that can be delegated entirely. The commissioner. Clearly, there are very important people that we have been able to recruit that are carrying on this program with great skill. But, you know, it's so fundamental to the agency that it can't be something that's purely delegated. So I think anyone who would be commissioner is going to have to be capable of taking an active role in that. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, 
there are many other qualities that are obviously necessary that are sort of obvious, like integrity, but, but I think in terms of the particular things right at this moment in time in the IRS that are, that are important is that those leadership skills to sort of keep things aligned and the sort of some, some contribution to making sure this modernization program moves forward would be two that I would mention in particular. I think uh, you, me, and uh, Mr. Levitan agree with that. When uh, the vacancy came uh, uh, that uh, was ultimately filled by you was the fact that I had asked the President, President Clinton, with Mrs. Maloney, my ranking member, got her on board and said, look, uh, we've had a lot of tax attorneys, we've had a lot of tax accountants, and they, what you want is a, a a chief executive officer, and uh, they uh, took it seriously. And uh, Mr. Rubin, I think, uh, talked with the uh, chairman of IBM and started scouting around, and uh, that's uh, how you do it. And uh, that's the difference, because we need somebody that in an organization of 100,000 people and all of these management issues we need somebody that knows something about uh, chief executive officer's role and what they should do. And so uh, I assume you would uh, agree with that. Well, yes, I think that having the experience of running a large organization is, is part of what qualifies you potentially to do those sorts of things. What about the people within IRS? Uh, you, you, when you go into other agencies, you've got a civil service group, you've got a political group. Do you find enough talent to fill the management yeah. jobs yeah. within the uh, professional well, staff? Well, th th this is something that is also very important and that this committee and others have helped with. Um, we do have a very talented executive group in the IRS. It's, it's remarkable. It's, you know, when you consider all the challenges that we have and the technology we have, it's amazing that we sometimes I think to get through filing seasons and, and do things as well as well as they can so it is very talented but the limitation is that there's a, the way it was structured uh, prior to the Re Re reform act is that there was one commissioner who was a political appointee and then there's the chief counsel as the political appointee and the rest were, were all career so you, what the only limitation of that is you had no people with really any outside experience uh, you know of how things work in other in other operations and as a result of the reform act we were given the authority to bring in a limited number of uh, people uh, from the outside for limited terms, which I think is important because they're not career executives. And we've, uh, frank, frankly, I think been extraordinarily successful with that. Uh, we have some people from major, it's not just myself with experience, we have people with business experience and other experiences from, you know, major companies uh, throughout, the, throughout the economy. And what has been gratifying to me about this is that there are people out there who have been successful, have track records, who are willing to do public service for a reasonable period of time in some very challenging positions. Um, and that's, that I, I would recommend strongly that that practice be continued because no matter how qualified a commissioner is, you need other people. And the internal executives who are most of the people who run the service and do most of it need to be complemented by a limited number of people who have some other experiences. Well, I agree with you. If I had my way, I'd uh, have a lot of the political appointees and other agencies to, to go step back and have the people that are there to figure out the talents to get the job done because it's got to be a continuity there and you can't just p come in for a year or two and disappear. Yeah. Well, of course, in the IRS, it's, it's, it's unique almost because there are no political appointees other than the commissioner and the yeah. chief counsel. What's the enforcement uh, mechanism within the IRS to ensure compliance with the tax laws within the IRS? And how many IRS employees have been punished for failing to f file or pay their taxes? Well, uh, the enforcement mechanism is consists of two things. One is that under Section 1203 of the Restructuring Act, uh, uh, the so-called 10 deadly sins, two of them have to do with failing to file and failing to uh, or underreporting income. And uh, even before that act was passed, there was a special employer employee tax compliance program which checked the tax records of every employee. So it was a disciplinary uh, issue uh, even before Section 1203 was was published uh, and was passed. And as a result of that, uh, and I don't know that I have the statistics here with me, I may, um, that
that we have a, uh, yeah, here it is. Um, uh, since the beginning of the uh, Section 1203 uh, implementation, uh, for the two sections that relate to federal taxes, they have been the ones that have had the most significant number of um, uh, inquiries uh, and, and, and people uh, substantiated. We had, uh, let's see, uh, failure to file a federal tax return. We had 269, um, as I have it, and 12 for understatement of tax liability uh, that were um, that were uh, detected and, and uh, disciplined uh, as, a, as a result of Section 1203. We do publish statistics on tax compliance by federal employees, and they're, they're substantially more compliant than, as far as we know, the rest of the tax population. And, of course, the, the highest rate of compliance is in the IRS, partially because of, of the um, disciplinary aspects that, uh, that, that are uh, um, incorporated in Section 1203 and in our tax compliance program generally. So I think we can be quite confident that uh, if there's one thing we know, it's that IRS employees are complying with the tax law. That's not to say there aren't occasionally uh, some violators and they are dealt with. The uh, next uh, number of questions will relate to debt collection issues, and you have to recuse on that, and Brady Bennett is the IRS designee for these issues. So if we can get Mr. Bennett up to the table. Uh, we will ask him the questions, and I think it's uh, it's something that uh, the next leader might uh, be able to do it. And uh, could I just clarify? Sure. I mean, I am recused from uh, the matter of the outsourcing and, the, and that project, but I can answer questions about the more general topic of you know what our debts are and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just uh, start in on a few. Uh, the IRS has been working on resolving the several complex legal, legal and technical issues inherent to contracting out uh, collection activities. And exactly what are these issues and what are you doing to resolve them and uh, when will they be resolved? I want to move the uh, microphone a little. We're going to have, I can't quite to hear you. You've got to talk into it. Yeah. There okay, we go. That's better. Again, there are a number of key issues that we are aggressively working uh, as we speak. But as you've heard, we must develop a process that ensures that taxpayer rights are protected in the uh, system that's designed. Uh, this process must ensure that taxpayers are afforded the same rights that they, that they would have uh, if they were working with the IRS. This, this would include a right to taxpayer advocacy referral or rights as afforded to taxpayer under collection due process. So that's an important area that must be included as we go forward. We're also working with our council uh, and have gained a better understanding of the limitations that exist due to the concept of inherently governmental activities. Now, this is an important distinction that, um, that we face in dealing with this issue. The IRS may delegate ministerial or non-discretionary functions to a contractor. Areas of discretion, however, may not be contracted out. The program must establish clear standards under which a contractor will work and be subject to uh, uh, rigorous IRS government oversight. And the final decision-making authority, however, must reside with the IRS. We must develop a system that allows contractor to access the data that's necessary. Uh, you've heard mention of, of, of security concerns earlier today. The system we establish will uh, certainly raise certain security and technology issues that we must address as we design the process. We're also looking at other government agencies, both federal and state, to better understand how the uh, effort can be funded. We're looking closely at the funding models that exist with the uh, Department of Education and FMS uh, as we, as we uh, design this system. Well, those are among the federal agencies that have uh, non-tax debt collection. And uh, that goes back to the Debt Collection Act of 1982 and the one in 1996. And does IRS face issues that are fundamentally different from those affecting other federal agencies? And if so, what are the issues? Yeah, yes, sir, we, we do. Uh, those two uh, 
acts that you mentioned do specifically exclude uh, debt that arises via the Internal Revenue Code. We clearly do face challenges in this area that are not present for other federal agencies. Uh, federal tax collection is constitutionally considered an inherently governmental function. It is permissible, as I said earlier, that to, for the IRS to contract out certain ministerial uh, in nature events where vendors are governed by strict guidelines and procedures. But again, the, the discretion may not be contracted out. And what this means is that as we go forward in the design, it's critical that we, that we develop clear guidelines, clear procedures uh, to, to ensure that the, um, the, that the design that's in place is uh, legal, prudent, and protects taxpayer rights. According to the uh, General Accounting Office, which we depend on as our arm in the legislative branch, IRS has discontinued collection action, or as the agency puts it, shelved about $12 billion in delinquent tax debts because of inadequate staff resources. In light of this, how can you possibly justify dragging your feet on seeking additional resources from the private sector to assist in collection efforts? Mr. Chairman, I, I um, personally have spent 23 years in the uh, tax collection business with, uh, with the IRS, and I share your passion around this area. This is an important area that we are uh, aggressively working. To accomplish this, we've created a, a partnership with private industry experts. In the coming weeks, uh, we will be working with a select group of collection contractors to agree on the type of inventory that meets the contractor's needs, while also meeting the objectives of the Internal Revenue Service to have an impact, positive impact on compliance. To identify the contractors, we, we developed, posted, reviewed responses to an IRS request for, for information. Uh, we used data gathered in that RFI process to assess the state of the private collection industry that currently exists to assess their ability to handle the size of debt we're talking about. Uh, we selected private uh, sector collection agencies to par partner with us. Uh, we're currently doing that right now. At working with them as subject matter experts to work through the issues I described earlier. We've also identified a number of alternatives for placing cases in the, hand, in the hands of the contractors. We built out on our pilot program uh, of 1996, uh, understood the lessons learned from that program, and are moving forward. An important piece of this is the, uh, is, are the type of cases that we place in their hands. We've begun to build a uh, business case that will aid us in selection of the best alternative as we go forward. Uh, would it not make some sense to at least give private collection agencies a chance to collect those accounts the IRS is ignoring? Or do you not ignore a lot of cases? Uh, unfortunately, our resources are stretched ex extremely thin, and we, and we uh, do not have the capacity to, to uh, work as many cases as we'd like. This is an area that um, where contract support, we believe, can provide some additional capacity uh, to, as opposed to um, uh, supplementing resources, uh, or, or I, sh I should say supplement our resources as opposed to supplanting resources. It will give us additional organizational capacity to, uh, to deal with this particular workload. So I think it's an important area. Yeah, well, I agree with you uh, when I mentioned that $12 billion delinquent tax debts because of inadequate staff resources. This is why some of that's got to be put out if you don't have the staff. We or agree, get sir. the staff, one or the other, and it get people off other things that aren't as important. This is important when people can get away with this. Yes, sir, it is very important. And it could be that the, the answer is in a combination of additional resources to work the right type of cases, for, to have the expertise to work the complex cases and identify the, uh, a, an appropriate segment of cases that'll, that can be, can be contracted out. However, as I, as I mentioned, there are a number of complex areas that we need to address and, and be careful in terms of how we design the system in the future so we make it work. Well, I'm delighted to hear that you're moving ahead in this area. It's long overdue, Thank to you. say the least. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, as you know, uh, we all are weeping a little up here. And uh, we'd like you to uh, have, if you'd like, 
uh, a closing statement yourself to the American people. And because a lot are going to be listening on our favorite channel of C-SPAN. So uh, what would well, you like to say to the average citizen? Well, first of all, for uh, the great majority of those people out there who are not cheating on their taxes <laughs> and are actually yeah. submitting their returns on time, which fortunately for the country is most people, I'd just like to thank every taxpayer for doing that. You know, it's not the most pleasant chore, but it's something that's absolutely necessary. And, you know, people have done it. Uh, some of them are still doing it for the rest of this, uh, this day, the April 15th, and most of them have already done it. And so that's, an, uh, I think, uh, an important thing in our whole American society. Uh, it's uh, something that we're very fortunate in this country that most people do. Uh, the second thing is that I think as far as the IRS is concerned, you know, we're on the side of the average American taxpayer. That's, that's why I've never accepted the idea that some people believe that somehow, you, you know, people will always hate the tax collector. You know, that, that idea has gone back to biblical times, um, and I think that maybe that was because the tax collectors didn't have their, their thinking caps on straight. Um, I think that um, we're on the side of the average American taxpayer, all those people that have filed those returns, done it correctly. And so what, we, what do we have to do? We have to make sure that we give everything that those people need. Uh, give it to them when they need it. And then the other thing we got to do is we got to go after the other minority that are not paying. So they're not, um, they're not allowed to increase the burden on the honest taxpayer. And that's basically what the IRS is all about. And uh, it's an important mission um, and one that um, we certainly have room to improve on. But at the same time, I think that we have made some progress in, in delivering on that. I uh, want to thank the members of the staff on both the majority and the minority. And uh, Jay Russell, and then I'll have a closing statement myself. Jay Russell George, Staff Director, Chief Counsel. And uh, Bonnie Heal next to him, uh, Deputy Staff Director. And to my left, your right, Henry Ray, Senior Counsel. Earl Pierce, Professional Staff. Uh, Justin Palamas, Majority Clerk. And for the minority, David McMillan. And Gene Gosa. Uh, Gene's the minority clerk, and Mr. McMillan's the professional staff, and uh, John uh, Boker is the counsel for Mrs. Norton. And we also have three people as court reporters, uh, Lori Shetekayan, Julie Thomas, Nancy O'Rourke. And uh, you can see we needed three reporters when we knew you were coming, so uh, we wanted to be prepared. Uh, I want to thank all the witnesses and uh, your fine contributions and the hearing, I think, has been very informative. We might send you a few questions for the record that uh, some members of the minority who have not been here might want a few. I again wish to commend you, Commissioner Rosati, for your outstanding work over the five years. You certainly will be leaving the Internal Revenue Service in better shape than it was when you took office. At that same time, as you recognize, the agency continues to face various challenges. I intend to continue to work closely with you for the remainder of your term, since uh, my term will be out as of uh, the 108th Congress, and uh, I'll be here until the end of the 107th Congress. And I hope that your successor as commissioner and my successor as chair of this subcommittee will maintain the same close and productive working relationship we've had. And with that, we are adjourned. That was good testimony. Oh, thank you. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. That was good, good testimony. Now we're going to go live to the Pentagon for today's briefing with and Defense Secretary explosion. Donald Rumsfeld and Killed, Joint uh, Chiefs Chairman uh, General Richard Myers. This briefing's just getting underway. Uh, uh, one, sir, at least one serviceman was also.